So, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Neil Gampa, and I'm here to, to, to talk to you about my experience contributing to a CentOS stream. So, before we get started talking about CentOS stream, I want to talk a little bit about me. Um, I kind of like to call myself a professional technologist. I've been a Linux user for 15 years. I should update that because it's actually now 15 years. Woohoo! I'm old. Um, a contributor and developer, Fedora, CentOS, OpenSUSE, Magia, and Open Mandriva Linux distributions. There's a bit more on the on the table there, but those are the main ones that y'all might care about. I'm a contributor in the RPM DNF ecosystem, a lot of related projects. And for my day job, I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Datto Inc. And a little bit about Datto. We were founded, you know, moons ago in the in the uh, in the Traws of uh, what is it called the uh, the recession, uh, but we're going strong. We've got lots of managed service provider customers. We're all we're global. We operate in the channel space, which means we sell B two B to businesses that then resell to their own clients. Um, we're over two thousand employees and growing. And you know, there we, we're hiring for doing all kinds of fun open source stuff. And that's why I'm here all the time. Um, we have lots of locations around the world, main offices in North America, Europe, um, and APAC, and more probably in the future. We're also remote friendly, um, and we offer a wide variety of products in uh, business continuity, um, business management, um, networking, all sorts of stuff, various IT services, things that people tend to need. Um, but enough about that. Let's talk about CentOS Stream. So CentOS Stream... Uh, is the distribution that provides a a continuously integrated, continuously developed uh, platform of what will become the next RHEL release. There are two major versions right now, CentOS Stream 8 and CentOS Stream 9. And those two versions have very different patterns. So let's first talk about CentOS Stream 8. So CentOS Stream 8 uh, was launched after rel 8 released which kind of makes some sense because the, the thing wasn't shaken out and it was really more designed as a, a a proving model of whether this could actually work because you know there were there were probably lots of people a little skeptical but the idea of like well do, do people really want to like put things into the rel ecosystem there's there's some evidence to show that there's some people want to build on top of it but people want to put into it so this was this was the starting point. It came after Rel 8, so it had some awkward workflows because of it. Because it Rel is already being developed, they're going there first, and then it comes to stream, and then you know, that's all rolled up and then made into a Rel point release, and then it was rebuilt into CentOS Linux, which doesn't exist anymore, but like whatever. That was that was the thing. Um, the workflow for CentOS Stream 8 was fairly simple, but also pretty difficult. It, you filed a bug in the Red Hat Bugzilla, and you attached a, uh, a patch, and then wait. It's simple, but it's alien to most people, um, except for like some of the oldest contributors that worked in the pre-Forge era in Fedora Linux. And it has the same problems that the pre-Forge era had. Um, one of the, the most annoying things is that nobody said anything or nobody did anything. Patches and BZs would just sit there and 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 wither on the vine unless somebody was like, for some reason, on a blue moon paying attention. Um, it's a little less bad in CentOS Stream 8, but it is definitely characterized by a lack of feedback until something happens. Either it's a rejection or an acceptance. If you want to see some examples of me doing this, I have some examples right there at the bottom of the slide. Don't worry about trying to copy these later. I will have the slide deck available. You can check it out then. Um, but like that's, it's simple and terrible, um, and and that's it's because uh, this this was very much a starting point, and I don't think people really understood what they were kind of getting into. I know from personally, um, I didn't enjoy really working on Stream Eight very much. I mean, I could do stuff, and I did, but I didn't enjoy working on it. It was not very fun, and it was it was quite difficult for me to feel like something meaningful was happening. So working with Stream 9, uh, CentOS Stream 9 takes a different approach. So it takes what we what we did with Stream 8, and it takes all the lessons learned there, and it applies them to make a better experience. So firstly, CentOS Stream 9 starts at the branching point for RHEL. 
So when Fedora Linux 34 um, was being um, stabilized, um, the moment that we were branching, uh, that, that Red Hat was branching for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, we branched and, and it created CentOS Stream 9. So the branching process happened publicly and you started to see this development happen. So like in April of last year, you saw it start landing. The first builds were coming out, the first composers. Nothing was in, set in place yet. It was all very woozy and whatever, but it was there. And then over time, they built in and plugged in from the lessons learned from the previous things, taking in some aspects of the workflows in Fedora and making a much better contributor-centric approach to maintaining this. Um, the workflow for Stream 9 is simple-ish. It's file a bug, so that's the same as the first one. The second step is different. Instead of attaching a fat patch, you create a merge request on gitlab.com. Um, and then something happens. Uh, and and the, the difference here where from the previous workflow in this one is the something happens is much more immediate. So most, if not all, of the uh, various aspects of CentOS Stream 9, various packages, sources, whatever, um, when you make a merge request, you'll have bots kick in. They'll give you immediate feedback, most of the time actionable feedback. You can see logs. In some cases, you may not be able to download builds. I think that that's something that they're going to work on to improve because like, it's really hard to do some work when you can't actually mess with the test results. Um, but you can have all those things and you see it and you can act on it and iterate really quickly. Um, this workflow mimics the workflow that Fedora has. If you go to src.fedoraproject.org and you make a pull request, you get you get bots kicking in, you got Zool, you have Koji CI, you have all that stuff, and you can iterate super quickly in there. And then maintainers can see that and they can give feedback and like the two together lead to a much more responsive workflow um, and things like that. Now there is a difference, there is a caveat. Um, as of right now, and, and I'm honestly not sure this will ever change, but as of right now, um, RHEL maintainers are the only people that can upload sources to the disk at look aside. So tarballs and whatever that go into the sources file traditionally in Fedora, it's also the same for Stream 9. No, only the RHEL people can do it. Um, importantly, I want to also mention that the, the Git Forge setup... Um, being on gitlab.com, yeah, whatever. But like the, the Git repos on there are not configured the same way as they are on git.centos.org. They don't use the SRPM style where you have subfolders of sources, specs, um, and whatever. It is the flat tree like it is on src.fedoraproject.org. It's actually super nice because it means that you can also cherry pick commits back and forth between Fedora and, and CentOS Stream 9. And I've used that a couple of times to like make things go faster. Um, because then validated commits, you could see all that stuff, and like whatever. Um, so that that actually was way better, and it was much much nicer. Uh, and and yeah, because you are working with the actual sources that everyone else works with. So that's just packages, and that was the only part for Stream Eight and Stream Nine that things were the same. But like, you can do more in Stream Nine, but how much more? So. You can also contribute to the release engineering process for Stream 9. This includes things like being able to help with the image composition stuff. You can handle work with package filtering. So if you file a bug and you say, hey, I have a, I have a, there's a package that I see in the CentOS Stream Koji and I need it to build a package in Apple. So I file a bug and I, and I want this to happen. You can make their lives easier by also filing a merge request to make the necessary additions yourself. I have a couple of examples where I did one in, in for composition groups and I did one for Punji, the compose tool. Um, super straightforward. Um, main, main caveat here is that there isn't a ton of feedback going on in here um, because um, apparently the bots and the and the pipeline stuff doesn't kick in when the MR is automatically convert, uh, is when the MR is converted to a draft status. Um, that uh, it's converted into a draft status oftentimes by, um, I'll call you uh, Josh Boyer, because like he's the one who's mainly doing a lot of these merging and a lot of this review stuff. Like, so he puts them into he puts them into draft status to keep people from accidentally merging them. But it has a nasty side effect in that none of the pipelines run. And so you get no feedback as you iterate. Um, that's something I would like to see improve. Um, and I think that might actually require pulling out 
um, some of the stuff from GitLab CI and putting them into Zool because Zool runs even when they're draft. But like the stuff that's wired into GitLab's direct integrations um, don't run when the M when the MR is in draft status. So um, that's something that I was kind of frustrated about because I couldn't tell um, until it was uh, you know not in draft status. So I would occasionally like unmark it as draft so the pipelines would run and then remark it as draft again so that Josh would get mad at me. But like that that's annoying. People shouldn't do that. Um, so the kernel is also cool. This is this is really the most phenomenal part. The stream nine kernel is open to contribution. You have the full Git history and you can see everything that's happening. And it's pretty, pretty weird as a project. It It is nothing like anything I've ever contributed to before. Um, and, and to be absolutely fair, I don't think it's anything like the kernel developers have ever worked with before. Um, uh, being the guinea pig here, um, we worked together to come up with a workflow and 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 accommodate some of the things uh, that are needed from both a contributor, external contributor side, and and the rel kernel engineering side. So it is a source Git project in the sense that like the packaging is maintained in the source code and everything is like integrated together, and then it does a a little thingy to export it out to the the um, disk Git for building in Koji. Um, Working with this is a little weird, and there's fortunately there's some documentation by the rel kernel developers. But also, um, if you if the documentation is a little bit too wordy and too um, uh, hazy to understand, I, I found that to be um, an issue for me. Like I had to have some conversations with them to kind of get some more concrete step. I turned that into a cheat sheet that for the hyperscale sig. So you can take a look at that. Um, there'll be a link to it in the in the references at the end of the deck as well. And that helps you like take commits from the upstream, backport them in a way that is that the rel kernel people can consume it and work with their workflows and stuff like that. There were some issues up front and we worked through them. I, I'm pretty happy with how responsive they were. Like this was by far my best contributing experience because they were super responsive. They gave feedback early and the bots worked most of the time. There was a couple of times where the bots kind of freaked out. I think one thing that was um, an interesting problem that I had with the, with the bots was sometimes the bots didn't fire correctly. And some of the, and when they, sometimes when they did fire correctly, some of the feedback didn't feel actionable. Like, so one thing that I discovered was that I needed to have my signed off by statement in the MR description. I also needed my signed off by statement to be in all the commits. And I needed it to agree with the names that and, and email addresses that are in my GitLab account. Um, when they are not all in agreement for some reason or another, the errors that the bots gave back were not very actionable. Um, I had to kind of interrogate to figure it out. Um, I put That's why I put some specific information about this in the cheat sheet. Um, I kind of, one thing I would like to see is like more actionable information in the error messages from from the bots when something is wrong. Um, another thing is that I, I would like to see that when the pipelines are done, because the way that the pipelines work, you can't look at the direct pipelines in the MR because if you're not a member of it, the pipelines can't run there. And so they run them elsewhere. And those pipelines are not super discoverable. Um, and for a long time, I didn't know that I could actually see those artifacts. I would like to see a message return back with like a link to the artifacts and like some information about how long they'll be around so that you can, and like some info on how to, how to use them for testing or whatever, because like, unlike all the other projects, this one, um, everything is super indirect and it's kind of difficult for people to external contributors like myself to figure out what's going on so that I can, um, respond with, I can iterate properly. Like I've had some, where it's like, I went through like nine iterations and it was mostly through puzzling out why failures were happening or why it was saying that this is unmergeable or whatever, and it couldn't, and it wouldn't give me more useful information there. But by and large, now a lot of those, a lot of the stuff is really smooth. And if you follow the cheat sheet, if you're like, for example, you have a kernel module that rel is not shipping, and you're doing it in kmod sig, and you're maintaining that, you can follow this cheat sheet to like take stuff from the upstream kernel and backport and send it as an MR. 
the rel kernel folks are totally happy to take contributions on that space and take it in and like we've we've talked about it pretty extensively like that's why the hyperscale sig is committed to maintaining butterfs in the in the rel kernel tree uh because they said that they're they're totally okay with it and uh, if you've got other things and, and stuff like that, you can always be helpful. You can always help out by doing that sort of thing. And it really does make things go faster and they do appreciate it. And like, I want to, you know, I want to specifically call out Don and Parit. And I want to say that those two people have Don Zikas and Parit. Um, uh, I'm not going to, I'm sorry. I'm going to butcher your last name. So I'm not going to try, uh, but Parit and Don, you did a fantastic job. And I really love how, you know, you came to the table and, and we worked together to make this a good experience or as good as it can be. Um, I hope to continue working with y'all to, to make this better. But like, yeah, so this is a huge deal. And if you need to have improvements happening in the kernel faster, um, on top of just once you file that BZ code, give it a try. Like we have it documented. It's good. It's an easy process to follow. Go for it they'll they'll totally welcome the contributors they're really nice and very friendly so working with centos stream 9 is good right like i've been saying all these nice things and stuff like i feel that centos stream 9 is a true winner when it comes to this the improved workflows and expanded opportunities like with the composes with the kernel stuff there's actually other things i didn't cover because i really didn't do them like so if the if the if rel is shipping some modules, which they will in future um, point releases, um, as part of the alternate um, application streams, you can contribute to those too. You can help them like making these things. If there needs to be um, unfiltered or filtered packages or some kind of fixes or whatever, you can actually contribute to all of those pieces too. You need more um, you need more images for more platforms. The kickstarts are also open for you to be able to contribute to them as well. Like. Pretty much every aspect of the distribution in some way is available for you to contribute to, which is a huge change from CentOS Stream 8. I think it's massively, massively unknown to people. And I'm hoping what this does is it brings light to the fact that it's not just the packages. It's everything that makes up the distribution. Um, I think the only real problem is that the, uh, at this point, like if it's not packages, um, the, the people that like work on the release engineering part, there's only like two people. And so be a little patient with them because they're poor. Brian is overtaxed and Josh, you know, picks up the slack where he does, but like, um, I, I kind of hope that eventually there'll be more people to be able to like respond to MRs and stuff like that there. Maybe there won't be that many. And maybe I'm the weird one that does all the MRs, but like, uh, you know, if there's more, I hope that scales out better. Cause like, uh, the responsiveness around that is, yeah. Um, the in general i think this process is this process improvement makes it very clear that there's an honest effort to build a cooperative platform between red hat and the centos community to build the premier community enterprise operating system i've said this before in other places and i'll say it here now i feel that centos stream makes centos earn its name more than ever before the community is able to build the enterprise platform that it wants. CentOS Stream is made for you to make it what you want it to be. So here's some references. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. So I'm happy to take questions. If there are any. I see no questions. <laughs> oh, Alexandra, we are all inspired. Yeah. Yeah. And so for what it's worth, like, uh, as I said earlier, um, if I had the thing on the right window. So in the references, I have links to contribution guides that have been written by the CentOS team and the kernel contribution guide written by the kernel people um and a cheat sheet that i wrote for the hyperscale sig um but yeah uh rich uh, at rich bowen asked can when can we do a contributor tutorial sure why not um i guess since hyperscale's got like an infinitely long list of things we could probably set aside a couple of them and maybe do them live in a hack fest or whatever 
Um, or like if there's some people who are interested, we could do one of those. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll live stream one. And yes. Uh, all right. So a couple of people are asking about my live streaming thing. Yes. Yeah, so I still do live streaming. Uh, and I'm streaming on Twitch. Um, if you go to uh, twitch.tv slash Centos Hyperscale, all one word, you can follow that. And whenever you want to see me do some live streaming of Centos work, there you go. Um, I also have a personal Twitch where I may or may not be doing that or other things. If you care to see all the other ramblings and stuff I do, uh, that is twitch.tv slash det underscore Conan underscore Kudo. Um, there are currently no recordings. I am currently trying to figure out how I'm going to have my setup persist so that then I could scale up to doing recordings. Maybe Rich and Sean, we can talk later about doing recordings and putting them on the CentOS Project YouTube channel or whatever. Um, yeah, so like those are all those are things that I that I'm that I've been doing, and yeah, uh, but yes, in a CentOS dojo, totally an interesting idea to like maybe just do a hack fest, walk somebody through like their first couple of contributions, or a tutorial session where like I do one in every single space, and and go for that. Um, but yeah, uh, anything else? Philip Perry says first time i contributed to a driver backboard in 2008 was for el5 it took two years to get it back into real how long do you anticipate that process will take with stream great question um well this is a bad right now is a weird time because i get to see my stuff land um within a month so uh, from stream to rel um i think in practice what's going to happen is that um for for stream stream merges into there, it's gonna take it's gonna take about a week. Um, I think that's about the median time I tend to see for stuff that I send in to get it landing. It's a lot faster than it is with Stream Eight because um, they've got some workflow things and the maintainers have to build it there and stuff like that. There have been some goofy stuff that have happened from time to time, but in general. Basically, the, the main main thing where people see it is that when it gets synced out to the mirrors, I'm not sure, um, Brian Stinson, um, if you're there, if you can tell me, I'm not sure if sending out to the mirrors is still a manual process or if it's happening automatically yet, um, because that's the real gate. Like, it has to, okay, so Brian, is, it's still manual-ish. Uh, Brian confirmed in the chat. So the that's really the inhibitor right now where Brian does it you know, himself. Um, Alexandra Fedorova mentions that it should pass verification by rail QE. Yeah, so I'm making the assumption that this has already happened. By the time that it's in there and built and pushed into a compose, that's already happened. Production composes happen, I think, twice a week, but they don't get pushed out to the mirrors that frequently because I think Brian is doing them by hand, which I am I hope that gets fixed someday because that's, that's not great. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so like the I would I would say for rel kernel it's basically about um, five to seven business days. For composes, if you're changing release engineering stuff, it's about one to two weeks. For packages, it's usually three to five business days. So that's 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 the medians that I could say I'd be reasonably confident in saying that that's how long it takes. That's a way faster turnaround than sometimes six months to never, which is what I got with Stream Eight. Um. So yeah, I, I think that that's that's gonna be, uh, pretty good. And let's see if I can mark this as answered or whatever. And it, I can't, but whatever. Um, Akemi Yagi asks. I recently came across a patch present in upstream kernel that affects rel nine. I filed a bug report against rel nine. What happens with regards to CentOS stream nine? So at this point in time, uh, that would go the, the way that the kernel development goes for rel nine is that it has to land in the CentOS stream nine kernel git tree first, and then it gets branched to or cherry picked or whatever to a rel minor release stream to be released for Zstream. Um, that's how it is currently right now. I don't actually know if it's going to stay that way post-GA. Might not. I hope it does, because that really does make life considerably easier um, and simpler for tracking. Um, if you 
if you have such patches that you want to see and you filed the BZ, you know, try out that work, the cheat sheet workflow that I documented and try sending it yourself. Um, they would totally appreciate it because it really helps them out. Because like the Fedora kernel people, except 10 times worse, maybe 100 times worse, the RHEL kernel people have so much backlog stuff. So, you know, any little bit helps. And they really do want to try to make this good for you. So, yeah. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Akemi. Um, Robbie Calicote says that's a lot better than before. Oh, yes. I, I, st I have one patch that's actually kind of critically important for package kit for, for CentOS Stream Aid that I actually filed the ticket like actually years ago. And I don't know what is going on, but then it got closed abruptly um, a couple months ago or something like that, saying we're not going to do it. But like for most of it, it's like, hey, this is still like a severe problem. This makes package get not work on CentOS. I made the fix. I did it as upstream and I backported it for you guys. Could you please pull it in? <sighs> Nothing. But yeah, um, source get stuff. I'm a little I'm, I'm a little weird about. So the kernel. Uh, so Brian, St the reason I'm saying Brian Stinson says, uh, for reference, the contribution and questions about the look aside uh, packages that are doing a source get style of development are handling things pretty well. Um, I don't know if I agree with that. So the kernel is doing okay. I didn't like my experience contributing to some of the vert packages like cloud in it. I had to make a fix there. I think that experience was super awkward and un and kind of unpleasant because it didn't do it didn't follow my expectations. Like MRs don't get merged, they get closed and the and the person like cherry picks it back in. Something is wrong there because that is not a good way to look and it looks bad from an analytics point of view. Like when I take those things and give reports back to you know people who want to see this stuff from me, it looks weird. Why are all of your MRs getting closed instead of being merged? What are you doing wrong? It it looks bad. Like it, I know it like in practice, like when things are released, it it doesn't seem to make a difference, but it's bad if an MR gets closed and a thing is cherry picked and your attribution is lost. I've had that happen a couple of times, and I'm super not happy about that. And I would really like that to not happen. And other and other people tend to live and die by attribution and making sure that those things are being done right, especially if they're doing it of their own free time. Like most of the stuff I'm doing, I'm doing on my own free time. I'm also doing quite a lot, you know, for my employer, Datto, but like I'm also doing a lot for my own free time. And my number one requirement is that my attribution is correct and that things are carried forward so that people can see that what I did mattered. And in some cases, probably out of ignorance or lack of familiarity with workflows, that doesn't happen. Um, that is really important to get right. And we've massively improved this in Stream 9, but there are some places where this is not the case. That was a problem when I was contributing to Cloudinit. Um, one of the packages that I contributed to had this problem as well. I would really like, you know, a next step would be the folks that are working on this workflows and integration and contributor experience Make sure that this stuff isn't left behind. This stuff needs to be correct because it is extremely important for making sure people feel like it is meaningful. And I'm gonna get off my soapbox a little bit and see if there's any more questions or feedback or whatever. Yeah, David Duncan says, I've literally watched Neil manage this over one of his working sessions on Twitch, and it's not pretty. Yeah, that's, it's not. Some of it is really tough. Like, I I still, the the kernel stuff I actually might be the only case where I've liked the source git stuff. Pretty much everything else, the source git stuff stuck. Source git stuff is not great because it. It obfuscates, in a lot of cases, it's obfuscating the contributions. You wind up having, you know, bylines just erased. And it just, it, it's really weird. And we don't have a good, we don't have a good way of recognizing contributions when they go through that model. Um, because, for example, RPM change logs will just straight up omit these people. 
in a lot of things. Like the Colonel did a good job. They made sure that that, that didn't happen, but almost everyone else, they don't. And those, those, those contributions are not attributed uh, Alexandra asks, do I work with the source kit SIG in Fedora? Yes, I am part of it. I've been a little busy to be able to attend the meetings for the past like six ish months. I'm hoping I can come back into that soon. But um, but yeah, like I think this is not in itself a source kit thing. It is more of a lack of correct priorities in terms of how you represent changes that go in through source kit to, to the stuff that people get. Um, and, and that might, that, that's a tweak that I think we need to just do across the board. Um, the kernel people did it right, but I think it's also because they kind of had to, it was, it, if you look at some of these, some of the, the deltas between, um, tag releases of the, of the rel kernel, it's massive, super massive. Uh, let's see anything else from people. Well, um, there's nothing else. It looks like that's it. Yeah. Thank so, you. So, yeah, thank you all for coming to my talk. I hope you got something interesting out of it. Um, and maybe this t the next time we do that, I do this, it'll be even better. Maybe we'll be in person next time. Oh man, please. Please, I want an imprint. I want to like meet people for real again. Yeah. All right, we've got 25 minutes, um, which is great for me because it's lunchtime. So, oh my gosh, um, I'm free. <laughs> Feel free to hang out in the hallway track um, and uh, join us again in 25 minutes for the next session. Thank you, Neil. Yep. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs>